John was born on September the 2nd, 1910. He was one of 15 children. There were seven younger. Now, two of the younger ones died. One of James Bernard was four years, and William Parker two years. And this is a picture of the eight brothers and sisters. Next is a picture of his mother and all the girls. Now how about how old were they the I'd say Helen was must have been twenty and that's the oldest daughter. You don't want names of them. Helen was the oldest, and then Isabel, and Sophia, Louise, Margaret, Frankie, and Teresa. What were the boys' names? Of course, there were some boys mixed in. <laughs> Do you know their, their names? Uh, of the boys? Mm -hmm. Well... This is five of them, they're all named okay. And then, <coughs> well, let's see where it was. The next picture is of Grandmother Medley and her 10 children, including John's father. And about how old were they then, or about what year? Well, they're pretty old. And um, growing up in grade school, John rode a pony to school, and there was a friend of his that lived close to school that had the barn, so he put the pony in the barn and walked the block or so to school. But how old was he when he did that? Oh, well, he's, I guess, in maybe the first grade on. I don't mind, probably not the first grade, but second or third grade. And uh, because they lived down, <laughs> Of course, now it's the middle of town, you might say, but at that time, it was at least two miles to school, from school, maybe three. And, um, let's see. Well, anyway, he rode his school and went, went to St. Francis Academy. When he was older, he'd walk about two miles to and from school. And on his way home, he always stopped at his grandmother's house on Frederick Street and go in the back door and she always had a hot of a baked sweet potatoes in the warming oven and she always tell the cook to put it there because John would be by. He'd come in the back door, get his sweet potato, get up, go out and walk and start walking home with his sweet potato eating it. <clears throat> And after we got married, he said, Now, Cecilia, there's one thing I want you to ever have is cherry pie. When he was around eight or nine years old, there was a wagon that would come by and sell pastries. And he bought him, uh, himself a cherry pie. <laughs> he went up on the hill in front of his house behind a tree, ate the whole pie. From then on, he never wanted a piece of cherry pie. <laughs> After St. Francis, after finishing the eighth grade at St. Francis, all the boys always left and went to senior high school because they had uh, football and athletics where we didn't have it at, uh, at St. Francis. And he played uh, uh, football. And he was um, captain of the team for four years. They had a game, one game, that Ben, Ben was the youngest of the five oldest boys, and he was in the eighth grade at St. Francis, but after school he'd go and practice with the boys. 
at senior high. So they put him in for one play so that all medley boys could have it. And this is a picture of the five boys. Yeah. Those two. We'll start over from the, from the left is Ben, George, Tommy, John, and Watham. So this is high school. This is senior high school in 1927. After high school, John went to University of Dayton on an athletic scholarship. At that time, the um, distilleries were closed during Prohibition, and they were really hard hit. They had to uh, work for everything they got to make their way through school. And while at the University of Dayton, he was called Iron Man Medley. He was captain of the football team for one or two years. He, played at the, he also played in band at UD uh, in the off season of he graduated magnum cum laude from University of Dayton. During prohibition, the, 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 the distillery closed. That was owned by his by John's family. And that was really hard at the time on the family. He had two older sisters and three older brothers. They had a large home on. Parish Avenue with several acres of land, and they farmed that with a big garden. The boys, they had to earn money, so and help with the family. So when John and and Tommy come home for vacations, they were putting in the sewer, new sewer system in Owensboro, paid well. So they both worked down in the ground with these sewers. And they would give their money to the family and keep out five dollars for spending money. Then, when the prohibition ended, he came home from college, and he and he worked at the distillery, helping to open the Davis County Distilling Company. And when they sold Davis County Distillery Company. A few years later, while John and his four brothers started their own distillery, Medley Distilling Company. I got married, we got married in October, and I kind of wondered that way because John's birthday was September the 10th, 1910, and I'm November the 11th, 1910. We got married in October while the paper had come out where he was a year older than I was. <laughs> Actually, only two months and a few days. We did not have TV at that time, so John and I would read books and all, and Gone with the Wind came out, and so good, so interesting. <laughs> he would say, don't you dare read a word of this when I'm not here. <laughs> you wait till I come home. I didn't have time to read it <laughs> during times. Did you have a big on a honeymoon when you got married? Well, we went on a honeymoon. We went to Dayton to a football game. <laughs> <laughs> but um, You didn't give him a hard time about that? No. And no, I, but what was so funny? What time did you get married? I, I'm not going to tell Liz. <laughs> 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 no, what time we got married? We got married at 8 o'clock in the morning, and that had, because at that time, you fast from midnight on, you know, and you couldn't have water or anything to drink, and so that's why we got married, you know, that early, and we had mass. We had home, and we had our breakfast, and then um, we didn't have a reception or anything like that. Then George had a new car, his brother George, and he let us have his car drive to Dayton. And uh, we went 
friends and all up there. His own girlfriend. His own girlfriend. There was this old girlfriend of his. Well, he she really was never a girlfriend of his. At least he's he's he didn't. He said he didn't like her, but she was determined that she was going to come down here and visit him. So his mother said, John, you have to have her down here now. So, or she brought herself down or something. Anyway, she did. And then the mother got after him because she, she wanted him to be nice to her. And, um, but anyway, um, uh, I guess he was. I don't know. And so when we went up there, the uncle had us over to his house. And uh, she was there, so when I was shaking hands, you know, then I put my hand out to shake hands with her. She took her hands and put behind her and never would shake hands with her. <laughs> it didn't bother me. <laughs> and he was calling to the Army, but he, his, uh, which he was already a second lieutenant, but he, um, his blood pressure was so high they wouldn't let him serve. So that was World War II, World War II. Uh -huh. 40, 1939? Well, something like that because 35, we married 35 and, and we had one, two, three children by that time too. We, um, after we married, we had a little apartment on Davis Street and we had to move because I became pregnant and they didn't want children and then we moved out here in the home we're in now. And we had a, this was our living room. <laughs> and uh, we had a bedroom in the kitchen. And it was, how they had made it into three apartments and we had an apartment here. We lived here for a while and then they sold and raised our rent. We had, couldn't afford it so we moved again. Then after moved again, uh, Mr. Ms. Medley had lots down in front of their home, which was now the Owensboro Catholic High School. All the property up the hill belonged to them, and they had lots down below. And we built a, a little home down there, right next to the park. It cost us $2,500. Two bedrooms, living room, kitchen, dining room, full basement, <laughs> $2,500. A few years later, we put in the stairway and the uh, two bedrooms and a bath, and that cost us 5000 and a little more. What difference just a few years made, you know. And now I guess it would sell for a hundred and something. In 1949, John and I bought our home on Maple Avenue. It, had, it has eight bedrooms and five baths. John was also a devoted family man. Together we had nine children. We took all the children to mass every morning before school, pile them in the station wagon, which now we'd have to take, I guess, a couple of three to the station wagon. <laughs> and we would say the rosary every night together as a family. He was strict with the children and wanted everything in the house neat and orderly. When the children would get up in the morning, the boys, same as the girls, had to make their beds. I'll guarantee you they weren't perfect, but they were thrown together because he wouldn't let them downstairs or make them go back up to, to make them up. And if I was had lots on my hand and he wanted us to go out, which he ever now and then, I'd think, I'm too tired, I can't go out. And I'm just worn out. He well, said, go on, get dressed up. I'll take care of the kids. He'd pile three or four of them in the bathtub at one time and give them their baths, the pajamas on, and send them to bed. We'd feed, we, did, we did feed them. <laughs> they, I wish I had a nickel for every box of cream of wheat and every can of applesauce because we bought it by the case and that really went through it. He took the children fishing and hunting in his spare time and he just, he was a great dad and a lovable person. We used to have large dinner parties and the children learned to serve and the parties from watching us and helping us. He was, they'd serve the bread that little ones start with and then 
they're grown by they they all know how to serve and so forth. John always went to their ball games and their recitals and attended many throughout the year. Even though with the nine children, there were always visitings, visitors. So I'd always start with 11, come draw myself and try to see how many more. And I don't suppose we've ever sat down at that lazy Susan table that there weren't at least two to three extra ones. We kept a key outside and the children that live in the country and their friends around, they knew where the key was. Now many nights when I'd get up the next morning while well, there'd be extras in the house that I didn't even know where it was. That must have been a challenge, uh, raising nine kids. Well, it doesn't seem that way. I, you know, you have one child, then you have another one, they just fit in, and then another one. I will admit sometimes when I get pregnant after so many, I think, God, how can I have another one? And take care of it. Fell in line, didn't pay attention to it after they came, while they're just as natural, I don't know. Just not, but I tell you, I did have a funny feeling though, that like, I was sitting there, <laughs> Doing mice, and I thought, God, look what John and myself did. <laughs> Wonderful husband. Just, if I was getting a predicament of some kind or other, he was right there helping me, no matter what the task was or anything. And it was always jolly, and I'm, only one time in the whole, our whole married life did I ever see him lose his temper. <laughs> his mother told me before we married that, now remember, John takes a long time to make it mad or something, but don't ever make him angry. I guess I made him angry because he blew on top. I never went to that far again. <laughs> I behaved myself. <laughs> but uh, it was funny. Watham was president and John was the Harbor. He was secretary, but um, he he was just he's the peacemaker. If there was any like he always was calm and all. Oh, but um, yeah, the, the, naturally there's some that's just like brothers and sisters and all, you know, they, they might try to kill each other and the next minute somebody come in and say something about one or another, you know, it jumped out their throats. But uh, no, they got along real well and um, um, Had they all pretty much worked with their father's distillery? Did what? It? Had the oh. five brothers learned the trade from their earlier oh, in the Davis yeah, County? That's all, that's all they ever knew. You might say any of them because that's all they ever knew. Right into that, you know, and um, Tommy was a master distiller, and he just was wonderful. And Tommy was a sweet, sweet boy. He just, man, he was uh, more like Tom, uh, John. They never had a child, and he said, "I'd cut my right arm off if I could have a baby of my own." And I don't know why, that, but they never did adopt. He and Emily, no, what calls it? Emily from Utica. <laughs> she was from Utica, Kentucky. <laughs> and John, that's what John Langer would say, Emily from Utica. Was there a lot of pressure when he first started the the Medley five, you know, the Medley Distillery? But um, well, not at that time because uh, the bourbon was in, you know, it was. Going and uh, they had, of course, of just like when they had to bar everything, and then when it was sold, it, you got that picture there where it was sold and the price and everything like that. Of course, they owed money, but then they all got some, but nothing like they would if uh, if they uh, hadn't, you know, 
cost 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 so much money to, to have it. And then of course we sold it at a perfect time because right after it the market dropped out of bourbon. Billy uh, worked in all the boys worked in the distillery. All of them. And uh, it really made it nice because when kids growing up, they need something to do. And since John was one of the owners, why, he was allowed to bring the boys down there. But he would tell the man, he says, he's under you, and if the latrines need clean that, tell them to do it, any job. I don't believe in, cause he's the boss's son. I mean, any job that has to be done, do it. And they did. Do you have any stories about all the labels behind the bar that he collected? And well, the when we built the rumpus room, Tommy and myself, we went out there. I told the man to make boards that would fit up there, and we took the boards and we either put them on the ping pong table or the golf or the pool table. And we laid the boards there, and we started these labels. We've got a lot of duplicates out there, but we could have put one each of how many labels that they had. But we got so tired of putting those labels and trying to start, you know, one at a kind, one at a kind on there. So we just picked out some that we liked, and we put several on there, you know. And then they slacked. I think they put slack. On that. Now each one of those labels was a label that was bottled. That we bottled. They bottled at the distillery. The distillery. They did a lot of. They buy Yeah, a lot of private labels. Yeah, there's I mean, a lot of private labels. They might not have a brand that would outsell something, but they'd have 1,400 brands. <laughs> San Francisco had every bar had its own. I have no place. idea how many brands they had. I wonder if anybody had a count on that. But and we went to lots of football games, wherever. Texas, uh, Notre Dame, Kentucky. but. Anywhere we went, it was very seldom did we spend a night. And when we'd go to these parties, and the parties were about 12 o'clock or 11 o'clock, we were home. He was a good card player, but there's one thing we would not do together, and I would not play chuggers with him. There's no way that I could beat him in chuggers. I could beat him in cards, something. No way. You very seldom, I could very seldom beat him when we are playing hearts. But checkers, no way. After once or twice, I wouldn't even try it. <laughs> Did he play bridge with you? or? Oh, yeah. We played. We had, we used to have just lots of fun playing bridge with Nella and Carlos Jago, the four of us. We had some friends. Carlos stopped in one night. They were watching us, and they said, I can't see why you two girls play with them. They're cheating. They're cheating you all. I, we said, we know it, but we're, we have fun. <laughs> and they did. They cheated all the time. But we, we had a good time playing bridge. You know, John loved horses. He's, he um, rode, and he and Martin Holbrook, his close friend, and they rode quite a bit. They kept their horses down at bands in the country down there, and I bought him a Tennessee Walker. It threw him, but he didn't say anything about it. Morton was quite anxious to come out and ride the new horse. He got on it, threw him, and <laughs> called me up to see you. Get rid of that horse and get rid of it right now. Don't you dare let John back off the horse. <laughs> John said, well, I know, but I, I, know, I know how to handle it. I can. So I called down there in Tennessee, and the man said, well, yeah, he knew it did, but he thought maybe he could handle him. And I said, I didn't buy a horse that had to be handled. So John and a friend of his took the horse back, and they got another. Uh, do you call them five-gated? Yeah, five-gated. Five-gated Tennessee Walker. And he really loved his horse. How you gave him the horse 
We the, kept him in the garage that night. I remember. See, that's what makes us so nice when they ran. They could remember those things. Well, he know. was in the garage. Yeah. And the rascal or something kept barking. And Greg met, Big Daddy said, go down and get that horse. Get no, no, don't go down. Horse. What's wrong with that dog? Go down and get that dog or something. But when he went out the back door, and that's when you showed him the horse. Oh. <laughs> over the years while we've collected a few pieces. And, uh, so you went along with the idea of antiques, huh? Oh, yeah. John, oh yeah, when John was young, he would take his mother and they'd go all up in the country every place. And they were always looking for antiques. And I suppose that is why John loved antiques. And there's very few men that'll go antiquing. And he would go anytime. And when we were down in New Orleans and on a trip one time down there, um, we said we were going to antique it the next morning. John's brother-in-law, he said, I want to go with you. Don't forget, I want to go with you. Well, they'd all had so much fun the night before, we figured he wouldn't be up. So we went on. We went on one store after another. We ran into one store. We found this beautiful Madonna. And uh, you took a picture. And uh, he, he said, um, we didn't know whether it would be too large for our home. So we put it on there to save. And uh, or they said, well, they put it on there just, you know, to keep something, let us think about it. Well, after so long a time, after we were so many places, had gone so many places, his brother-in-law caught up with us. And he said, I told you I wanted to go antique with you all. And he said, and I saw back there where you had this picture. And I said, well, uh, or painting. I wouldn't say it was a picture, it was an oil painting. He said, uh, I said, well, we want it, but we don't know whether it would be too large for our house. He says, bad. If it's too large for your house, I'm going to take it. <laughs> and their home, I expect, was larger than ours. Anyway, it fit beautifully in our house, so we have it to this day. But he loved to antiques. We used to go up to Mud's furniture place up there at auction every week. And this Mud told us, said, said he learned so much from John because <laughs> he let us have things, I guess, cheaper than, not that we, we would buy according to the, but I meant he would, would have gotten more money out of him if he'd known later. John really did. He knew his antiques and, and uh, loved them. I can remember the last dog. He had talked about Airedales for years and talked that, that he said that's always, they always had an Airedale. So the last dog I guess we had, we finally found one someplace and uh, we gave him the Airedale and put a big bow on his, around his neck, gave it to him for Christmas. It was the dumbest dog that we have, we had of all the dogs around here. <laughs> we had it tied on a long chain that he'd go from into his little dog house on one side of the fence and then come around the front and he'd be out where he could see us. There was a fence in back of him and instead of walking around to his death, he tried to jump over the fence and hung himself killed. <laughs> he, was, he was the dumbest dog. I don't think I've ever seen a dog as dumb as that dog. <laughs> it was terrible to go out there and stiff when they got to him. He, 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 he had Dalmatian he liked real well for a while. Oh, yeah. oh, well, he liked Dalmatian, but yeah. he talked about the Airedale all the time because that's the kind of dog they had when they were young down there. But, but no, he, the, he was crazy about it. Dogs, this um, black man that worked for us about 40 years, I guess, when we were 30, mm -hmm. and uh, he said one day, he said, uh, Miss Midley, I want you to come here and watch. He says, it's about time for Mr. Midley to come, and said, now I want you to watch this dog. He's on the back porch, he's laying there asleep like, a few minutes I was watching and I saw him jumped up 
looked up. By the time he got down to the end of the porch, John drove. He knew that car, the motor or something. He said every afternoon when John would come home, that dog would jump up and stand there there waiting for him. But he he had to hear it down the street. It was the funniest thing it was. I'd buy their face there, but of course, Gullis was standing there in the kitchen, you know, and working, so. Huh? Gullis worked here 30 or 40 years? Yeah. Gullis, Gullis, Gullis worked here. Oh, at least 30. Yeah. Um, no, he worked here a long time. And um, never did complain, just, and I know those kids could go on his own. <laughs> I went up to see him when he was sick in the hospital in Louisville, and I was so glad I got there. I wanted to go, but, you know, you just can't ask kids to take you places when they're working. You know, you feel so. I, this time, I knew Danny was going. I happened to hear that he was going to be in Louisville. And I said, couldn't you take me up? I said, I can go in a hotel and sit and wait. I don't care until uh, uh, he gets through his meeting. So he took me to the hospital. Went and see him, and he didn't know anything to nobody. But when I went in, I said something. I went over to him, and I, uh, the nurse was in there, and he, she said, "Now you ought to eat something." I said, "You know," she was talking to him real sweet. She didn't know anybody was anywhere near him, so he, of course, wasn't paying much attention to her. So I walked in. I said, "Govis," I said, "It's Miss Medley. How are you feeling?" And all, uh, oh, and I said, "You know." I think you better get up. We all, you have to get up because we're going to have to make biscuits. When I said that, he opened his eyes like that and the next minute. But that biscuit, because he made thousands of biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, he, no, that woke him up just a, just a second, but you know what there. But he was good to all the kids. Never told anything on them, and I know he had lots that he could, talk, could tell, but... I'm sure he had a lot of juice. He could have blackmailed us all. Yeah. No, when when we bought the house, uh, it was in three apartments, and we renovated the house. We made it back into one big home, and we did most everything that was done uh, and ready to move in. I know it was a year or two after we were in that we did build the back porch on it. And then uh, I know I was in here one day and I said, I want to put a bookcase in. And um, I could see we could put one there and it would leave the same space, you know, as open right here and it wouldn't hurt. It was good. So we put that in and then we added the rumpus room just call the kind of young children and all playing and um, partying and all. But um, we did most all ever. I mean, it originally faced Frederick Street, and it was they said 3,000 acres to it. And this was in the country. See down 18th Street, two or three blocks down, was the end of the city limits. Now I don't know how, what year that was, but one time that was the city limits and uh, uh, this is country the streetcar across from Frederick Street there's a went out to the Hickman Park you could get on there I vaguely just vaguely car sort of looked like in my mind when I was on the streetcar and I, I and, and yet I can't say it was either I just Something in my mind flashes a little bit like maybe I've seen this house. I don't know. When did it seem like you all put on the columns? When did you all do that? Yeah, that was when Mer when uh, Ellen got married. We didn't have them on because we were looking for them. But what uh, Char uh, John had always said, I'd like to have columns on the house. And um, the we, it was half roof, you know, and uh, there was short columns all the way around, but not, he felt like it, which I think is beautiful with the tones on there. And uh, Carlos Jago, he was, uh, had the plane on the planing mill, and uh, 
Carlos was wonderful at design and everything. I told him what I wanted a bookcase, and we got an architect to draw it up, and I said, that's not what I want. Carlos said, why didn't you ask me? I said, I didn't know you could do that. And he drew this, and it was exactly what I wanted, but I couldn't tell anybody how to draw it, but he drew it up for me. Well, anyway, um, he said, now, John, wait a minute. You're talking about putting a roof on that. If you're going to put a roof on that, now it's time to put your tall columns on. So when um, we renovated the house, the war was over, and a man named Bob Gates had been in doing uh, carpenter work and all, before he went in, but he'd been shell-shocked. He was just a wreck. And uh, Carlos says, Bob, got a job for you. No, not able to work. Now, wait a minute, Bob. I want you to take this job. He said, I'm here, something happens, we'll take care of it, we'll do it. I want you to do this job. So they had some architects that worked at the silver out of Louisville. So they came and took a picture of the house and then they went inside and looked what could be done, you know, and so forth. They had three plans and uh, <laughs> I was supposed to get back to them and tell them what I wanted or something, and we just took the three plans and did them <laughs> out of the, the out of, you know, what they'd uh, drawn up. We had this large front porch, and the children used to go out, and we'd had dances out on the front porch. But we had a neighbor that was old, cranky, like me now, <laughs> <laughs> that complained about the children the noise, so John said, he just decided he'd build a big room for the kids. So we had this 20 by 40 rumpus room, which has been a lifesaver in more ways than one because we have enjoyed it so much. Children had parties out there, and especially Sarah Jane's crowd. They really, every Saturday, they met been out there, and they danced, and they, and it was far, it was, the house we're in has eight 15 inch solid brick walls, so upstairs in our bedroom, we couldn't even hear the noise. And, and you couldn't, even with Jan, when Ben had his practice out there, you couldn't barely hear thump every now and then, you know, that was, that was it. And it's, it was built in 1953, the soundproof room was used for everything from dancing to band practice. John was a marvelous dancer. He was as light as a feather on his feet, which you could not believe to be as large as he is. And uh, he um, would go to our dances. Our little crowd that we ran with, well, uh, uh, it was 10 couples. Well, it was, I guess, there were 20 anyway in the crowd. And some of the husbands wouldn't dance. And some of them danced at now and then, about well, one and two, but John tried to make the rounds. And we'd dance one dance, and I wouldn't see him again for until it was time almost to go home. And I was so jealous that why I can't quit dancing with all those people. <laughs> the only time he got around one dance a piece, you know, the evening was gone early. And I was dancing in the meantime, but I just liked to dance with him because he really was a marvel. In 59, John and his brother sold the distillery. 
John continued work there for Renfield Distillers for five more years. At that time, he bought Quality Beers franchise, Quality Beers. But when he went back up to New York, he told this girl that the grass was blue in Kentucky and that you got to go. Yeah, go ahead. Huh? I'm listening. Go ahead. Yeah, what? Yeah, go ahead. I got to oh. go. But. Anyway, the grass is blue and that um, they have, you know, they're just, they don't have anything. They have horse and buggies and everything that's way back. So John dressed up in Billy's shirt, which came clear down to here. Billy dressed up in his shirt and hers had a coat and it was up above his um, daddy put on a shirt and left and he always had this bay Wendy, you know, so he had unbuttoned his shirt down there where it was showing his belly and his pants pushed down. And uh, who was it? What girl dressed up? You Frankie, had, you know, Frankie had on braids. Frankie had her hair in braids and her tooth blacked out. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, it, it was I unbelievable. Yeah, and when she friend. came around, oh, when she got off the airplane, they said they'd probably beat her in a horse and buggy. If we'd have known that, we would have probably gotten a horse and buggy. But we did have the Model A. Did we meet her in the Model A? Oh, I thought it was the Cadillac. I don't know. But anyway, they met her at the place. But on the way home, or sometime, no, that was on the way to the distillery, she was asking me if we had TV, and I thought she was saying TV. I thought, well, what was she want? I said, oh, no, honey, we don't have TV. And one of the kids heard, see, I hear so badly. I guess I've heard badly then. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have TV. <laughs> but anyway, when she came up here to the door, they all were out there on the porch to meet her. In the meantime, he had told them that when they have company, they have chitlins and um, uh, lamb fries. And she was sick before she ever got here because she thought, how in the world, there's no way I can eat chitlins. And they told her what they were. And um, so when they got ready, it wasn't here too long, you know, until the time was for dinner. Well, I think we had fried chicken. I don't know what it was, but anyway, <laughs> she was too sick to eat. <laughs> she just made up her mind that's what you're going to have. They told her everything on the face of the surface, but <laughs> all the way down to the, to the um, distillery. She was looking out the window and she said, there's one, there's one, there's one. They said, what? What do you mean? That, 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 that barefooted, the barefooted. They told everybody went barefooted. <laughs> it was cold, chilly, you know, and some little kid had run out of the house to the next door. You know how kids run out. And the little thing was barefoot. That's <laughs> their They don't know what she's talking about. She said, I found out they don't all go barefooted and they also, the grass is not blue. <laughs> And uh, I don't know what all, but they really had her going. She was, so they had the joke going for for an hour or so? Uh, or Yeah, well, every time I turned around, there's something, you know, she'd discover that wasn't like that. And, uh, <laughs> but she had, she thought it was, she thought it was going to be a horse buggy and all that thing. And but you know, when my, uh, when uh, Mary Wathen went to Dayton, uh, they told, uh, they knew they were coming, the roommates that were going to be with them, they knew they were from Kentucky. It was Mary Wathen and um, Mary, Bryan. Mary Bryan, that's uh, Aunt Helen's daughter. And they said that, uh, they thought, you know, that they heard that. And they said that the, those roommates that they couldn't wait to see them because they just wondered if they'd have any shoes. <laughs> so, you know, and I said, well, that's ignorance on their part because... They heard those stories and they just never did look into it. <laughs> they said they wondered if they'd have any shoes and that was the funniest thing to me that ever was. Well, uh, 
they all, they they kept Wathen and John and the others. They you know they didn't keep. And um, as far as I know, I don't know whether he worked there longer than five years or not. But uh, I can remember that's when we went on that tour, wasn't it? When he. When they sold the distillery, that's when we yeah, went on the cruise. cruise. When they sold the distillery, I don't know whether we went on it then or whether it when when we retired. When he retired, no, it was in '59, so it was when uh, we went on '59. It's when you sold it. Oh. He was uh, asked about the, the 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 fellow that the people that owned it at that time. Paul De Beers, I mean. Um, Anheuser Bush, the old man was living, and he was a very much family oriented, and he wanted the people to get the franchise that were head families. He wanted somebody with families. He wouldn't think of let you know a single person have it or anything. And the, the man that um, the people that owned it were old and retired, and of course it wasn't. It was a little bitty tiny place they had up on the. Was Bolivar Street between Third and Second, and uh, that was the warehouse. And then we bought the property out on um, Breckenridge, and that's where it's been ever since. And of course, it was nothing at the time. And John Jr. had just uh, finished college, and John asked him. He said, "How would you like to run it?" And he said, "Yes." Well, there wasn't anything to run in at that time. I mean, it was nothing. It was so small and all. And he's, John, and his hard work and running for years, and he's just done one gorgeous, beautiful job. But we had such bad competition here with uh, Steele's had the Miller and that, but they were politicians, and they, I, fact, I think, even some places you couldn't even put in beer in their places. Now, I don't know whether they won't that repeated you might ask John about. Um, that you couldn't even sell to them because they're just talking poli politics, you might say. Mm -hmm. Well, then it came on down to some of the sons, and the one that owned it decided he was going into the coal business, which his father, where his father made so much money. And uh, he sold it. Well, after he sold it, then that's when the thing just went big because John was, he was in politics some too, but he was loved and all, and he just went big. John and I took eight of the nine children to South America in 59 on a cruise. Our wife was married at that time and, and was expecting, so she wasn't supposed to, wasn't, wasn't allowed to go. So she and Bill didn't make the trip, but the others did. It was one of the most outstanding trips we've ever had. It was just marvelous. Everybody on board just loved the kids, but there was a, it was a bunch with um, that had families too. Of course, ours naturally were the largest. And they had games, and these kids would win their prizes. We've got the aluminum uh, trays and things that they won, you know. And um, it, it was just a marvelous trip. And everybody is supposed to be in costume. But they tell you before you come on the cruise, to please, to get you a costume. Well. If you could have seen me with my little book and what children were going to be in what state room, and those clothes have to be in that clothes, though that case of uh, footlockers, what I did most of them, and uh, I'd think, oh, did I put so and so's underwear in? Well, I had it written down as I put the stuff in there, so all I had to do was go back to my book. And uh, I did not have time to think about costumes. So when they got ready to have the um, uh, party, there was a friend came up and said, do you mind if uh, Danny, uh, they had 
one little boy. They wanted Danny to be with him. I said, no, I was tickled to death, so I didn't have to worry about him. His, him he said, I need that she'd get his costume. And Danny says, I want to be a shoe, and Ben says, I want to be a shoe shine boy. And uh, so he, um, every place we went, we would stop and you'd see these little boys and their little boxes and their shoe shine kit. So we dressed him up as one of those little shoe shine boys. And Ellen and uh, Frank Beth, they were going to be like they'd been asleep and they had a call for um, emergency, uh, you know. Uh, what was it called, you know? The, like a fire drill. Or yeah, fire drill or something. something. And they got up and they had their life preservers on and their pajamas and they were. Hair uh, rolling and all that kind of yeah. stuff. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know what in the world I was going to wear. So I told Johnny, I said, Johnny, I'm going to be the old woman in the shoe. So he went down and got asked for some boxes. The whole cruise people, the whole business, they do anything for you to, to have this, your costumes. And uh, he, I said, go down and get a big box and make me a shoe. Well. <laughs> No, Johnny, he, it's Cusick, baby. It's in here, the shoe. It's just darling. And, um, he, but he didn't have a big box. He had to take these little ones, and he made it look just like a shoe. And, uh, this, well, it had to, he made it look like laces. I said, take shoestrings. He took shoestrings and put it there, you know, for the shoe, the lace. And I got in it, and he make, made, ropes over my shoulder, and I was the old woman in the shoe. And, uh, in the shoe. the only shoes. thing was, one yeah. fellow was by himself, and he's dressed up, and he asked if, I could, if he could be with me. So he's with me, which it should have been by myself, you know. And uh, so, um, let's see, Ben, and Ben was shoe shine, and Some, Billy, yeah, no, I mean, Billy was shoe shine. And Ben was his monkey. Oh, wait a minute. That's right. Billy Billy wanted to be the shoe shine. I forget about it. I think that Billy's grown. But no. The woman wanted, he was a horse, wasn't he? Who was the horse? Let me see the yeah, it was one that had the horse's head and a little mic was on him. Maybe that was Billy. No, Johnny. I, no, Johnny, Johnny wasn't in costume. He made my costume and they don't even have one there. Ben, Danny was the one. Danny Billy. was the monkey, wasn't he? Oh. Danny was the monkey, I thought. Could have been Ben. You think that? Look at this. You probably don't want that. Oh, yeah, I put them all. Yeah, I think uh, I'll just let you have these. So this. what about John? What was that with his belly out? What was he just? It, I think Billy is the one with the um, sucker. I have, to, I have to look at it. Now, Ben's, Ben's a shoe shine. I've got not that picture there. And Danny was the monkey. Danny. Oh, Danny. This couple, that was the couple with the three children, wasn't it? The Millers? Yeah. And she was played the accordion. And they had him attached to her. And he was down like this. And they had a black wig on him. And they came up the steps, and I said, well, who in the thunder tarnation is that? Because we knew all the kids on the deck. You would have no more recognized Danny than a man in the moon. He, he That dark wig, a wig made his eyes look dark. We just couldn't tell him that was all of his face. And yeah, they had stuff on his face, too. And he's, he's here, there, as cute as a butt. We had so much fun on that. Now, this is the South and, American cruise? Yes. And now, I don't think Tommy was, uh, I believe Tommy is the one the sucker, and I think Michael was the horse, uh, Billy was the horse. I think so. And all Johnny did, he didn't get any credit, and he, he was the one that, there's the shoe. It's as clever and cute as it could be. 
see. So what was your husband? He was just... Huh? What was his uh, costume? Oh, he's big a dad. pirate, and he sh tried to show how big his belly was. That's what they did. That they those belly there were some other fight ones, too. And that's... Uh, And that, and these are. Um, this was in the. Um, it was in the Cincinnati paper about the ten touring medleys, the whole thing about it because it was it was just unbelievable. This picture here. Everybody on the boat entertained us constantly. They'd have cocktail parties in different places. And they wouldn't invite everybody. Each person kind of had their favorites. But they invited us every time. We went to every cocktail party. And I said, John, we got to do something. Well, Danny became eight years old on the party. So they always make a big to-do on everything like that. So I said, I know. We'll just show you. Show you. Sir, champagne. All the grown-ups and the others, the kids, you know, they can have the Mary, what do they call them? Shirley huh? Temple. Shirley yeah, Shirley Temples. And uh, so at the night, the dinner, well, they announced comments of the bad list to everyone. And of course, we entertained the whole business and uh, for champagne. And then, as uh, to say, Shirley Temples for the kids. And uh, which made us feel good because we couldn't have a cocktail party because there's too many. <laughs> but anyhow, it was. It was more fun than any trip that we ever made before. This one little boy, uh, Mike, his grandmother and his mother were on the trip. And uh, he was a little puny thing and didn't eat, wouldn't eat or anything. And I could, in fact, he was on John's shoulder all the time. He had him around his shoulder all the time. And they carried him around and um, they'd play airplane with him to get him to eat his food. You know, this, here comes the airplane. And they fed him all the time. And of course, naturally you become close friends, you know. And Michael is now, he's just finished an uh, electrical engineering job. He's, of course, he's in his 40s, I guess. Maybe that 40s, I guess. But um, he was well rotten, actually. Yeah, John, he'd take the children down when they'd get ready to get married and get in there and sit down with them and say, now let me tell you something. You're getting married. And I'll tell you right now, so you, if you're going to do anything, do it together. Don't you go out to boys and you men and play bridge and you girls go out and play your bridge. says, you all do it together. He says, that way you stay together. He said, do things together. And he did. He talked to all of them and tell them that before they get married. <laughs> and he'd also tell them, he said, now, we've got a big house. It looks like, you know, there's a lot of money here. But he said, when you get married, you're on your own. <laughs> Which was right. In 73, the second of our youngest children, Ben, died of malignant brain tumor. He and his wife, Denise, had one daughter, Emily, was, who was about six months old when Ben passed away. He was, he always said, I'm a breath under six feet. He was... About 11 plus. <laughs> just seemed so much bigger. <laughs> he was about six foot. He was big, but you know, I think John was a whole lot like Ben. When Ben was in the hospital in St. Louis, you'd have said he was enormous, you know, like, and he, the doctor said, you know, he is not big, fat. There's no fat. He said, that's all frame. His frame was so big, and his big, big wide shoulders and all, you know. And the uh, doctor says, no, he's not fat. It's just that he said that. Boys a big frame. A little older, we, we we went to quite a few places. We had this friend, um, Jan and John uh, Boardman, and he was um, um, 
Steel. Uh, uh, he, he, what would you call him? He was a retired steel huh? executive. But yeah, he was a, a retired steel executive. Uh, secretary. And uh, he, he, he belonged to a club in uh, New York of all of these people that were in all different trades. And they would give their services to any foreign country and they would pay them uh, their room and board and food and laundry and things like that and transportation and all. And um, so he would go to different places and he had a plaque that went on the wall and he had, I think he'd gone five times. Some of them never get to go any place, some once or twice, but he was so good and, and uh, he was really a diplomat. He could get along with anybody, this John Boardman. And um, they were real close friends of ours, so about a week or two before they were to go to leave wherever they had been, which would be from one to six months, the first place we met them in uh, was San Salvador. And we left Owensboro, and I think we went to uh, Hong Kong, we stopped there, and then went to Kyoto, Japan, and come on around, you know, and went to San Salvador, and they met us, I think it was San Salvador, and uh, we stayed there about a week, and we would tour she, the wife of Jan, and the, the two of us, we'd see things, because John was working, and then uh, we'd tour, and we came all the way through, went to Turkey, and through Europe from home, and then um, the next time we went to um, Istanbul, and we were there about a week, and uh, it was just wonderful, to, like that. But if I had it to do over again, and I suppose they did at that time, we would have gone down and gotten uh, um, at the desk and asked for tours because. You see so much more by going on a tour than you ever can do yourself unless you're just there young and can walk and go. And we went, I've forgotten all, where else did we go? We went to, went to Kuala Lumpur sometime. Yeah, we what. went to Kuala Lumpur and we were there, for, as I say, usually about a week before. Went to Penang, uh, Penang, and uh, these were boat trips, or you'd fly over, and yeah, we'd fly, uh -huh. and uh, we would stay wherever you know they were for about a week, and then go. While we were there at um, Kuala Lumpur, the head of the country, the queen, or something—I don't know what they do. They have queens in there. I've forgotten, but wherever she was coming, and when we. Was coming back to our hotel, the big red carpet was rolled out front, and everybody was so excited. <laughs> and uh, it seems like to me we saw her, but I'm, I guess I wasn't too impressed because I can't remember too much about it. But we have 26 grandchildren, and he, we had 26 grandchildren. He loved to to tell them about his scar on his forehead. He said that the Indian hit him with a tomahawk. <laughs> Their eyes would get big and want more stories, more stories. <laughs> he had a nickname from almost all the grandchildren, was always teasing them about something. He always tried to make the children think he was gruff and, or he would growl, but all of them, he was just kidding. And he was soft-hearted like a, like a great big teddy bear. The, all the grandchildren called him Big Daddy. Big Daddy's garden and all his roses. And oh, yeah. Roses. He'd come home from the office and immediately put on his work clothes and go out in the yard. That was when we didn't need it. Yeah, right. <laughs> we were too busy up to a certain time. And then when I started playing golf, I just 
loved it. And I wanted John to go play golf. And he'd say, oh, no. Waste, waste too much time. He wastes too much time. That's about the only thing I think we really disagreed on. That was he would not play golf. He'd go, he'd come home, put on his old work clothes, and go out there and then this great big garden had one in the back house and one over the little lot we owned over. Work, come in about 5.30 in the afternoon with a great big bushel basket of green beans or tomatoes or something. <laughs> I want to kill him. Every, nobody wanted him. He said, give them to the children when I start complaining. Give them to the children. I said, there's not a child that wants that, those beans. They're not going to take those to can them. They're not going to fool with them. And, we don't need them. We don't need them ourselves. And uh, but he just had to do it because I, he liked it. And he enjoyed it. So so what? He loved his white suits, his bow ties, and uh, his what kind of hat? What'd you call them? Panama hats. Plantations. Summertime come, he took care of those Panama Panama hats. For a while they cleaned them in Owensboro, then after a while you had to send them off to clean them. It was real funny, he took his Panama hats over to a cleaner on Frederica Street and uh, before, just before he died I remembered we hadn't gotten them back and so we asked him where he sent them and he said where he took them, we took them over there and went on up there to get them and he said no, we don't have them, we didn't have them. So we, Ask, I think, every place in town. Nobody ever had them. Well, about after a year, um, Gubbis was over to one of the, to the dry cleaner over by the house, and they said, I think we got some Panama hats. They came in and said, I think they belong to Mr. Medley. He says, I don't think so. He says, Mid Medley, they got those hats Mr. Medley's back, and said, I told him I didn't think so. I said, let them keep them. I don't, I'm not going to pay to have them out clean. <laughs> they didn't have them at the time we were looking for them. No, we never did collect them, so I don't know what happened to them. I didn't want them. Had he always worn the little Kentucky bow tie? Yeah, when the, well, that's, that was their, um, what do you call it? Uh, like trademark. Advertisement, I think. Yeah, after they got him, he never wore anything more than I mean, he always wore the bow tie. When we were in Hawaii, he got, he said, we were someplace, and he said, um, let's go back to the room, and it was so unlike him, and I said, what's the matter? He said, well, I just don't feel very good. And I said, well, where are you hurting? I said, you know, I was just made me sick. So we were upstairs. He had to go up a big bunch of steps. We were looking for a battery for his watch. And uh, so we got back down, and I think we got a cab and went back to the hotel. Then I was scared to move. Instead of going to the hospital or something, you know, I didn't. I just, we just was careful. And where we were staying, the hotel, you could come down, and there was just a, a whole bunch of little places that you could go and eat. We found a little place we liked, so he didn't have to walk any distance. And I think it was a day or two before we got ready to come back. And um, so we, the morning we were leaving, he had our two suitcases and he was carrying them. I couldn't carry them. And instead of getting a bellhop, it's the first time we'd gone with this, it was the Miles. They were having the, they were in charge of it. And I should have gone to him and told him we've got to have a bellhop or something, but I, I didn't want to make a scene. I don't, I don't know, you know, if you had your life glove over, you'd do things different. But anyway, he was carrying them, and I looked at him and sweat was coming. He was just, his heart was just, it's awful. Because he could have had a heart attack. But anyway, we made it home, and uh, when we got to Orangeburg, I said, don't touch a bag. And I called the kids to come pick us up where they dropped us off. And um, then the next morning I took it to the doctor. And he said, well, he was on the verge of a heart attack. But he gave him medicine and he was fine. I mean, he got along just fine until the scleroderma hit him. And 
the doctor showed me in the book. A man very seldom has it when he has it the last year. We were there, I think, in April in the next May or something. where it comes from, who has it, what causes it, or anything else. At the age of 70 and 81, John died of scleroderma. I guess you could say that John was a character. He was one of, one of a kind. He was so kind to all of his friends, his considerate. He was a wonderful, wonderful husband and a marvelous daddy. The children all loved him, his grandchildren loved him. He was so good to me. Always buying me jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> Did. Took me three weeks to, to, to buy that jewelry, not waste and, and pile so they could draw for it. <laughs> it's true. It's just... Well, John was just good as gold. He, he was so kind and sweet to people and considerate. And he was to the children, he was to the, his friends, and everybody liked him, but as I say, he was a character.